list cast. Network. Our pitchers start kicking ass, just like it said at the beginning of the program. Man of the hour, tower of power, too sweet to be sour. Sending your ass on the jabroni jet to the other side of the territory, brother. The Alabama Hammer. Nightmares on the best part of my day. The goods from the woods. Hot damn. Welcome to the Goods from the Woods. My name is Rivers Langley. Pat Riley. Mr. Goodnight, man of the hour. Tower of power. Too sweet to be sour. And uh, we're diving into a pay-per-view. Of yeah. Diving in head first, if you will. Into, That's right. Into the worst of wrestling. Not the best. The worst of wrestling with our guest. Nick Thomas. Repeat guest. Yeah. Repeat guest Nick Thomas. Our episode about trucker crank. Yeah. Yeah, another. <laughs> And Red Cell Vine is as much a part of truck driving as CBs and hot coffee. Now, I got, I have about nine ninety nine a month. What what could I do with that, Pat? Well, for nine ninety nine a month, or if you're non-committal, you could pay twelve ninety nine per month uh, to get the WWE Network. And thanks to the wonder of Vince McMahon's new, uh, probably soon to be failed venture. We will get to see the uh, best of wrestling history, but a lot of the worst of wrestling history. And the four of us are all wrestling fans. So what we decided to do is uh, hang out in the back, eat some pizza, uh, have some pumpkin bread. And we are going to draw and see which um, infamous pay-per-view we are going to watch. There's a lot to choose from because WWE... Uh, has all of their old pay-per-views, but also all of the old WCW and ECW as well. Yes. And surprisingly, so a lot of these worst pay-per-views weren't even ECW ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. However, a lot of them are WCW pay-per-views. And in the bag right now... Yeah, so you, you got a grab bag full of how many pay-per-views? Twelve. So it's twelve major shows. So there's a few Clash of the Champions, which were on free TV, but they were big shows. Which I insist are good. <laughs> and <laughs> of those twelve, how many are WCW shows? Ten. <laughs> I wonder why they went out of business, you know? Yeah, so we got it. We got the grab bag uh, here. Uh, what do we have? What do we reach have in that bag. Now? Let's What's see. Go, look, reach in down. Grab that bag. Grab that bag and pull out something Got to get to the bottom. Break my mouth something proper. Fall Brawl 1993. Oh, boy. Fall Brawl. What? Oh, I don't even. Well, I we know 1993 was a pretty shit year for wrestling all around. So it can't, it can't be that bad. I put even worse ones in there, and uh, this one was one of the ones I put in last. Well, you know, so. nine to three WCW still had some talented guys. They had Flair, they had Anderson, they had Rick and Steamboat. Well, uh, does this does this have the War Games? Yes, indeed, it does. The okay. Match Beyond. So. <laughs> The, the match war, beyond what? And, and the war, I don't know, beyond what? I don't know. Uh, bed and but bath. it's usually, you know, <laughs> war games matches are usually very good. So This could potentially be good. This could be potentially good because this one was one of the, the fringe ones that I put in. So it had the fingerprints of Dusty on it. Yeah. Yeah. Was it Dust, Dusty's idea well, to have the, the thing war with games? Like war games and gimmicky cages and shit's always all about Dusty. See, the war games I remember because I, I – didn't start watch, watching wrestling until about four years after this. So the war games I remember Shame on you, Dad. was where, well, I was a child <laughs> at the time. It already peaked. <laughs> <laughs> the I, one. Kid, I went back in time when I was a kid just to watch like Stanislaus Zabisco and shit like that. <laughs> So there's no excuses for not seeing older wrestling. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, when I started watching it, there was the, the thing I think, it was whatever pay-per-view where they slammed Ric Flair's head in the cage. <laughs> like, I think they probably did that a lot, but it was like a big deal uh, for yeah, one of those. Was, uh, Kurt Hennig, uh, Mr. Perfect, turned on uh, Ric Flair because he took Arn Anderson's spot in the Horseman. And then he turned their backs on the horsemen and joined the NWO to yeah. become the 47th member of the NWO. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was like when they were pushing that's when Virgil. Everybody was in the NWO and nobody wrestled. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. They just went and talked shit. Well, there was yeah. the main guys, and then there was that whole B team, like Vincent and Big Boss Man. I always thought like that they should have like a, an Adventures of the NWO B team where it was like <laughs> Brian Adams and Virgil, IRS, and Scott Norton, IRS, Horace Hogan. Yeah, and they all just go on capers together i would watch that shit yeah that'd be almost as good as desperados remember that one yeah. they should have put that on the network if it's ever a show yeah they they do like a legend's house or some shit be like legend's house but oh, yeah God. w john waltman can throw up on himself in every episode 
that so, was great. So we're gonna we're gonna come back and um, we're gonna give you guys a recap of what uh, what we watch. And I don't think it's gonna be too bad. I really don't. I I've always been optimistic. I've always been a, a a big fan of WCW and NWA. Because so some I'm of the options some of the options that we did have was like when RoboCop wrestled. That was good shit as like, far as I was concerned. It changed my life. The ding dong a tag team called the Ding Dongs where their whole they wore masks and had bells all over their outfits. That, that was fell bad. Off in, in the middle of the match. It was falling in the ring. Yeah, so we had a lot of bad things. Jingle. Yeah. Um <laughs> so this might actually be good. So we're gonna Joshing you jingle balls. You we're understand. gonna eat some uh <laughs> We're gonna eat some pizza. We're gonna uh, we're gonna have some pumpkin bread, and then we'll come back in just a moment. Good night. Do you have a song we should play for the for the interim, like uh, something wrestling related? Oh, how about uh, well, it's a big show. <laughs> like, how are you not gonna use that one? Big bad show tonight. <laughs> well, I was gonna try to use the Jimmy Valiant theme song, but why not the big show? Yeah, let's go with the big show theme song, and we'll be back in. Uh, well, <laughs> it's the big show. <laughs> Big, big show tonight. You ever hear the Elvis version? <laughs> no. Well, they call him the big show. <laughs> big, bad show tonight. <laughs> big show, big show, bad show. Let's cue it up. Well, it's a big show. Jesus wow. fucking <laughs> Christ. I had a decent nap at one point. <laughs> uh, I officially just hate wrestling. Yeah, no. I'm done. I'm I can't done. watch it ever again. We, we thought this was going to be a fringe bad wrestling show. This turned out to be one of the worst things we've ever watched. Well, we probably should have watched it high because maybe we would have fell asleep We'd still sooner. be here. <laughs> The only drug that you could take to make that like possibly tolerable is PCP. Yeah, because it would speed up yeah, the it was, evening's it was proceeding. Too hot today for any PCP or anything. Because like <laughs> the heat was kind of putting me to sleep by the middle of that Ric Flair, Rick Rude, <laughs> fast-paced match. Okay, so you guys, to give you guys some context, this this show was uh, was three hours long. Yeah. Three. Hours long. Three hour tour. But and, it felt and, like being stranded and, on a and desert the, island. And by the way, not three like TV hours complete with commercials that ends up being 90 minutes. Three goddamn hours that long. That we sat through every <laughs> fucking just, second. Just of. to give you an idea of, of this, back when it was out in 1993, somebody would have to call their cable company and ask <laughs> to order. Fall Brawl 1993 and pay on their cable bill 29.95. <laughs> That's too you much. You could have bought the Spice Channel with that money. You know, you could have watched the Goofy movie twice. Well, I think that was a couple of years later, but there's all kinds of other things you could do with that money. Maybe there's a massage parlor in Jurassic your town. Park came out that year. Jurassic, you could see it like what? What was that? Three times? Yeah. Something? And get popcorn. And yeah. But if you do that, you don't get to see uh, Jesse Ventura dressed oh. up as Rob Halford oh, for God. three so, hours. Well, let's let's recap this. Well, so sort of, the thing is, the Jesse Ventura's clothes kind of loves their novelty about an hour and a half in. Yeah. Oh, that's true. So we we start out with Fall Brawl 1993 with a uh, montage of rights-free uh, black and white films of the 1950s. I know. I was reminded. Do you remember the first Clash of the Champions where Eddie Haskell was a guest, a celebrity <laughs> guest? I shit you not. So I was, I couldn't help but be reminded of that. And they and they said that you know they they brought back to a time and hearkened to a time where it was everything was good and everything was pure. Yeah. And then Fall Brawl happened yeah. 40 years later. <laughs> Turns out it was B-roll from Duck and Cover. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it cuts to a really bad computer graphic of a board game with the state of Texas on it and two dice. <laughs> <laughs> and they go through the matches, and including the most explosive match in wrestling history, War Games. And we're going to get to that in a little bit. 
Also, it should be added that there's a computer graphic of a tank that rolls in the screen. It was cute. I liked it. It looked <laughs> like those little firecracker tanks. Yeah. Remember that? I used to find the ones that had been shot off at the beach, and I'd play with them like little toy tanks. Yeah. The, with, the, with the chickens, too. They also had the chickens. Yeah, the ones that the chickens. That sometimes it'd eggs. be a tampon applicator lying on the beach, <laughs> and I'd put that in, and that would, <laughs> that would be an MX missile with tank and line. But uh, they, uh, they, had this, they had this tank pull up and all i could think was like this is 1993 like nowadays it's the kind of computer graphics like a child could do but in 1993 that probably cost them seven or eight thousand dollars I just think, I actually, I think Dustin Rhodes did the graphics himself. Uh, I got this computer program, Daddy. I've been teaching myself ITT I tech. I had my son do it because you know the kids they know everything about the computers out there. <laughs> they use all the resources at Turner. By the way, WCW was owned by uh, Turner Broadcasting as well. Also owned Leave It to Beaver with yeah. Eddie Haskell's appearance in so, Clash of the Champions. <laughs> so this was one wing of Ted Turner's. Uh, media empire it was kind of uh if we were to put it in roman terms it would kind of be uh doria maybe like kind of uh, it'd be one of those little the germanic be, territories yeah. yeah or even like britannia it'd be it'd be something the romans didn't really care about keeping because that was actually that's what led to the end of wcw in the first place the time warner people didn't want it well really it'd be like what was caesar's favorite place that no one else gave a shit about <laughs> The that's the, territory. Yeah, that's more accurate because doll. it's my understanding Ted Turner was all about it. Everyone else in the company was like, you're well, an idiot. Yeah, well, Ted Turner had a long history with wrestling, going back to the Georgia Championship wrestling days, which is one of the things that made TBS. I, I remember watching when he when he first bought uh, the NWA, um, Jim Crockett Promotions, which was run out of uh, North Carolina. And it was the shit. And he was there with uh, Jane Fonda, who he was married to at the time, and Ted Turner was into the wrestling. He was loving Loving every minute of it. Jane Fonda looked mortified. She was just like, what? What did you buy, Ted? It was like he rolled up from the bar with like a... a Jaguar that he had bought from the well, front. I don't think lot Dusty, you know, because Dusty for four thousand bucks. And Dusty and being a Ma the Mac and Dream and all that. I don't think he liked being in the same room with Hanoi Jane. I'm sorry, Jane. Did you not know who you fucking married? <laughs> like you married a guy who claims to be able to ride his horse on his property from Mexico to Canada. He's a fucking crazy person. He was a guy. And Ted Turner was manager of the. He named himself manager of the Braves for one game, so he could wear the uniform and just run around. And I think he got kicked out of the game, and they lost the game so he has the dubious distinction of having the uh, worst winning percentage of any major league baseball manager ted he, turner he had a, he had a cameo, oh one he had a cameo in uh, gettysburg as well as a confederate officer so he lost pickett's charge too so he's, <laughs> he's <laughs> over two I love, I love ted ted's great he's a he's a good man he, he supports a lot of good causes including world championship wrestling and boy was this awful so we start out with the announcers the announcers are uh, Tony Schiavone, who's about as bland as you can get, and Cur current Braves. Uh, or wait, no, he works for like the what the the Triple A affiliate. He started as one of those. He started as a baseball announcer. But answer. his co-host was future governor of Minnesota Jesse Ventura, <laughs> and boy, did Jesse come out dressed to the nines. <laughs> Well, it's like uh, I mentioned earlier. He looked, he was dressed just like Rob Halford, <laughs> and he knew he knows about as much about wrestling as Rob Halford does, probably. Like, and he he has wrestled before and doesn't know shit about it. He's it's, he's wearing the clothes of like a guy who, named Jacob that we went to school with that was shopped at Hot Topic, just like this well, studded my jacket. Maybe we should he had a bald head. Except for there was some kind of weird tail had, in the back, a, which you could only see tail. when he turned like his head to the tail. side. Like he managed to be bald and have a rat tail, which and, and a goatee yeah, and yeah. wrap around sunglasses, like Oakley razor blades with purple croquis. Let's not forget the purple <laughs> Southern frat boy croquis, the studded leather jacket and leather pants. Now you get a glimpse of the purple croquis every now and then. He, he was like he was trying to. They kind of blend in with the ponytail. He was like, Jesus Christ, what am I wearing tonight? <laughs> <laughs> this is bad even for my, even for one of my, I gotta say that's a I, I hit the city about 1 a.m. <laughs> loaded, loaded Shivani. <laughs> I, I, I want to say this though about about the interaction between Shivanto and uh and the chemistry, the non-existent chemistry, if you will, between yeah. Shivanto 
And, it's like they were n- have never spoken before. Well, they, yeah, and and uh, Jesse and I don't actually think it was either of them's fault. Is Jesse was obviously trying to do that like thing where he's the heel antagonist, and he was taking all this cheap heat about like Texicans as he calls them, and about like women and stuff to try and get Shivanti to do like a gorilla monsoon with her. Will you stop? But Shivanti would not take the right. bait and would just no sell it and go back to the play by play. Yeah. Well, I will say that I mean, as terrible as they were. They were still selling the goddamn match. Well, they were hand. miles better than anything today. Yeah, because, you know, the, the difference, if you actually get the Now net- they shill Mountain do the whole fucking yeah. time. Yeah, <laughs> if you get the network and you go back and you watch any matches, doesn't matter if it's WCW, you know, ECW, WWF. AWA even. All of those old matches, like, the announcers are doing their job, which is to sell the story that's going on, it, whereas now if you watch it, they're talking about what happened in the previous segment and what's going to happen in the next segment. And they don't give you the play-by-play. They just react to stuff that happens in there. They go, oh, yeah. look at that. I almost spilled my Mountain Dew. Yeah. There's hardly any talking like nowadays, like between Michael Cole and JBL. It's, it's the worst fucking announcement I've ever heard. Yeah, they don't talk about anything. It's just like, oh, trending worldwide. Yeah, it was like dead it's silence. This, this like, thing we should have talked about an hour ago. Yeah. <laughs> So we, we the, they talk about what's going to happen. It takes place in Houston, Texas, uh, not at the Astro Dome, but the Astro Arena, which is uh, also known as the Mullet Arena. Yeah, because the there's one theme about this because it takes place in Texas and in 1993. This show was all about sweet ass mullets. God, I was there were a hockey game. There was a lot of mullets in this. <laughs> if this show was a car, it would be a Chevy Monte Carlo. Well, there was a lot of mullets and a lot of bugle boy, uh, <laughs> bugle boy in the crowd. And, and to so. start, uh, even though Jesse Ventura's like hair kind of qualifies as a mullet very loosely, the first mullet of the show is Eric Bischoff. Yeah. Oh, who? The, uh, who? <laughs> He also had his hand glued to his ear, apparently, the whole show. And he was wearing a uh, a tuxedo with a bolo tie. <laughs> you know, it was Texas. Yeah, and he had his hand stuck in his ear the entire time like he was listening to some earpiece, like he's, like he's Kermit the Frog. Yeah, when it, like he's in the fucking Secret Service and he's got some shit, like live news updates coming in his it ear. It didn't move the whole time. If you, if you want to know it what... It was he, like crazy. Somebody crazy glued his hand in his ear as a rib or some <laughs> shit. I think I think the best way to describe it is if you guys have ever he didn't s- scratch his ass before the match. If you ever if you guys ever saw the Roy Orbison black and white concert where he had a lot of uh, famous people in it like Elvis Costello and Katie Lang like the last the PBS special, yeah, yeah. Um, Eric Bischoff was basically stole Bruce Springsteen's outfit, <laughs> like he stole Bruce Springsteen's bolo tie suit. The one from the cover of Tunnel of Love. Yes, yes, <laughs> oh. yes. Hands down the best Springsteen song. <laughs> That's my favorite. Who's <laughs> a drunk <laughs> Rolling Stone loved that album, by the way. They gave it five well, Rolling stars. Rolling Stone, Springsteen can do no wrong. Yeah, let, let's because Dave Marsh, I think, works there, and he worships at the altar of Springsteen. Yeah, I, I you know, well, I'm... I can't wait to keep talking about this pay-per-view, but fuck Rolling Stone, because uh, they gave a good rating to that U2 album that was on everybody's phone last <laughs> month. Not mine. <laughs> did you Did you listen to any of it? No. I'm not no! going to say it's good, but you should listen to it for comedic value alone. It's fucking hilarious. I just saw the first one. The first track is called The Miracle of, of Joey, Joey Ramone? Ramone. Go fuck yourself. He may as well. Go <laughs> find a hole and get fucked in it. Wait, may have, he may as well have dug up Joey Ramone I, and just pissed on his fucking face. I fucking face. hate Bonner so much. I, uh, God. It's a horrible song. I like Bono <laughs> Duck. <laughs> <laughs> so after Bischoff shows off his sweet mullet and his uh, sweet uh, Bruce Springsteen and his suit, sweet finger and his sweet ear. Uh, we what? His sweet finger and his sweet ear. Oh yeah. Um, the first match, which uh, put us into a false sense of security, was between Ricky the Dragon Steamboat and uh, Lord Stephen Regal. A gimmick I've always loved. The Lord um, Stephen Regal yeah. gimmick with a- Sir a- William. A.K.A. William Regal. Yeah. Now, let's not forget Sir William, uh, Bill Dundee from Mempho right. as his little uh, manservant there. <laughs> I, I always, because he was Lord Stephen Regal, I would love to see Stephen Regal go to the uh, House of Lords and do his parliamentary duty. I always thought that would be really good, just him in the parliament, just laying down the law. I would like that, yeah. Putting people in the Regal stretch to pass, you know. He'd probably be Tory, though. Yeah, he would. He would. Uh, Jesse Ventura has an awesome line about Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, who is dressed like a dragon. Uh, he says, uh, Jesse Ventura says, a lizard should not wear a belt. <laughs> Which is, uh, that's pretty great that he just didn't go on about lizard people after that, though. He, he, ma- he maintained 
somehow managed not to do that like he always does. <laughs> <laughs> this is pre being a conspiracy theorist, apparently. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like you probably. He probably was. He just didn't have they, a, they cut a, his pla- mic. <laughs> a platform. Yeah. Well, they cut his mic out at one point during the show. He's yeah. He start. Well, he started goofing on women and on. Uh, oh shit! Was it? What was her name? Sarah Lee. Yeah, Sarah, Sarah Lee. Lee, which was the actual name of the sound person, which I led, of course, like at least one bit of Crocker joke. <laughs> and so she actually cut his sound out during ah, one. To match. which he responds. Gra- he grabs Tony Schiavone's headset and says, "I I hate you, Sarah Lee. I'm always gonna buy Betty Crocker from now on." Should have pulled Bishop. <laughs> finger out of his ear and shouted in that. <laughs> uh, the the uh, announcements in the ring were done by Michael Buffer, which was terrible. <laughs> he kept referring to Fall Brawl as Fogwa. <laughs> it's like he just. It's almost like he knew what he was getting into, though. He's like, I'm just gonna wear myself out now, right out the gate, and just get it out of the way and what? not give a fuck. What what like matches? needed buffer because it, it like he wasn't bischoff bischoff had a boner for buffer because he announced <laughs> no says it because he announced <laughs> boxing and shit like that and so he thought oh no. we're gonna spend the money get buffer no and but, that'll make us look legit because he did it all through the nitro era too. yeah no i remember during the nitro era but he would only bring him out for the main event that makes sense but buffer was just out sporadically like sometimes he announced the 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 match sometimes he didn't i just want anybody out there listening if they make a Bischoff had a boner for Buffer shirt. I will wear it and buy it from you. <laughs> so it's, I can't even begin to do that. The match was okay. Um, the white balance went off on the camera at one point. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, so first of all, there, at one point, like, the technical problems with the show were just hilarious because, yeah, they the, the, the white balance was all fucked up. They went back to a camera. It was just completely washed out. And then about halfway through the show... I'm, I'm not jumping ahead here. Tony Schiavone, uh, his mic cut out, and they just, I guess, went to, like, the external mic on the camera because it sounded like he was talking through a toilet paper tube to be, to like be fair, though, To be fair, though, technical problems like that are common with wrestling pay-per-views. If you watch the WrestleMania 2, there's a lot of technical problems with the New York part of it at the beginning. Tony Schiavone sounded like he sucked helium at that point. It was very... It sounded like he was doing... I was waiting for him to go, Magnum TA! <laughs> Because uh, he never just said Magnum T.A. He, he, his name, he always had to say Magnum T.A. The match was good. Um, it lulled us into a false sense of security. Mr. Goodnight uh, said that we had picked a good show. Well, I thought it was. Um, it was at that point because I, Steamboat, by the way, came out with taped ribs. He was selling a rib injury. The if you time. break your ribs, you do not put tape on them in one space. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, I ain't a doctor, and apparently no one uh, involved. Ricky the Dragon WCW Steamboat was also uh, was in a phase where he kind of resembled Dean Kane, <laughs> <laughs> which would have been uh, very popular at that point. Yeah, I think. Good luck. <laughs> Steven Regal was wearing his Chuck E. Cheese cape. <laughs> Uh, uh, he looked like he shot some curtains at like a <laughs> at like the Burger King <laughs> kids castle or something um, made a cape out of him. Uh, Lord Steven Regal won the match after uh, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat got hit with an umbrella. An umbrella. A a primo athlete a bumper loses, shoot, if you will, a brawly. Gets hit with an umbrella, and I hope at the next show it was Ricky Steamboat versus an umbrella. <laughs> Which he could probably work for a five-star match. Uh, I gotta say though, that umbrella would probably hurt more than some other uh, uh, similar foreign objects. Woman's uh, old laptop, for example. <laughs> <laughs> so the match ends, and we cut back to Eric Bischoff in his sweet mullet, uh, where he's interviewing two more sweet-ass mullets, uh, the Nasty Boys. Nasty Boys, alias Bebop and Rocksteady, yeah, the, uh, alias Bebop. Beavis and Butthead. Yeah, they look like, uh, basically, if you turn Bebop and Rocksteady from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles <laughs> into back into people, uh, they would be the Nasty Boys. <laughs> Uh, they have uh, they have mullet mohawks, or as we figured out, they're called mullhawks. <laughs> <laughs> mullhawks, and Bob. they got their clothes at the rock and roll. Rock and <laughs> 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 they got their clothes at the rock and roll store at the mall. <laughs> but uh, like Mr. Goodnight mentioned earlier, he said they're like Beavis and Butthead, but it's like that episode of Beavis and Butthead where it shows them in their future, like they run into themselves in the future. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what they look. Like. So the Nasty Boys spit. Uh, they cut something very annoying. Uh, they said a bunch of stuff about how they were going to... How they were nasty. Yeah, okay. they talked mo- 
mostly about how they were nasty. Unfortunately, uh, though, they didn't do the pit stop in WCW. And unfortunately, they didn't come out to Janet Jackson, Nasty Boys, which I always wish they <laughs> would. They claim the song was about them back in the AWA days. Uh, I shit you not. So the next match is where it starts to go off the rails big time. It is a match between Big Sky and Chief Charlie Norris, which... Um, Big Sky. Big Sky, you may remember as uh, Sabretooth from the X-Men movie. Yeah. Chief Charlie Norris, you probably don't remember from the short-lived <laughs> AWF in the mid-90s. And Chief Charlie Norris, surprisingly, not the most racist character on the show. And having nothing to do with Chuck Norris, neither. <laughs> yeah. I liked him. He looked like he was all set to go to, like, Morongo Casino or something <laughs> for the powwow. I have no recollection of this match because I think I fell asleep. <laughs> well, Big Sky, um, Big Sky uh, was a bad guy, and his whole character was that he was big, and he was from Saskatchewan. Man, that's the best gimmick I've ever heard. <laughs> from the wilds of Saskatchewan, it's Big Sky. Um, that's it. And his his finishing move was called the Big Double Foot. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked like uh, Chris Jericho and Kevin Nash fucked. <laughs> yeah, I immediately remember this match now because you said Chris Jericho. He was like wearing the same shit Jericho wore yeah, when he yeah. first started in WCW. Um, there was a uh, the crowd chanted "We want Flair" and they chanted "Boring." Uh, there was a lot of kicking, a lot of punching, a lot of a lot arm of snoring, twisting, a lot of snoring. And then a uh, lot of blinds at the bathroom and a lot of popcorn sold during this event. <laughs> uh, Chief Charlie Norris extended his uh, his streak, his winning streak with the big double foot. <laughs> <laughs> That's his finishing. And he went on to win, I think, three or four more matches before he showed up in the AWF. <laughs> And then disappeared into, back into the wilds of <laughs> fucking Saskatchewan. Wherever it came from. Uh, right. oh, but, well, no, Big Sky got mutated. Oh, that's right, yeah. I'm getting them confused again. Next match, Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff and a big fat slob <laughs> <laughs> who called himself the Equalizer. <laughs> yeah, I love the Equalizer. <laughs> he looks like he spends a lot of time like throat punching people for talking shit about Foreigner. <laughs> Just a, just a horrible person. <laughs> versus, versus Too Cold Scorpio, who was my favorite wrestler as a kid, and Too Cold was awesome. He could dance. He could do flip moves. Uh, he was great. Uh, and his tag team partner, Marcus Alexander Bagwell, who is best known for two things. Uh, one, well, being, one thing with two parts. Uh, well, that's Because <laughs> he one, had the best butt in a match. <laughs> we'll get to, yeah, uh, Marcus Alexander Bagwell... Uh, Started before he was a professional wrestler, was a male stripper, uh, and that's how he got into the I business. Think he still is, and he's on the show Gigolos, where he is a uh, professional male gigolo. Um, and at this point, Goodnight gets so bored with it, he starts to muse. He asks the uh, question, "Who has the best butt in this match?" <laughs> I think it was Buff. I have to say, uh, Buff has the stuff. Buff had the stuff. They surprised me. He was better than Two Cold Scorpio. Two Cold Scorpio, when they showed a clope up of his face, he looked like Mac and me. <laughs> <laughs> it was a younger, more agile buff, and he had rock hard ass. So I mean, uh, him not wearing a uh, like a cat in the hat hat with spray paint all over it took away from it. It took away from uh, how great his ass is for me. Like I, so, I gotta give him. I gotta uh, give him. You know, at least second place on that one. I did write my favorite part of the match. Uh, didn't really have to do with the match. It was just Jesse Ventura just going. Up goes Bagwell. Down goes Bagwell. Um, yeah, it was. I gotta say, it was nice to see Mr. The, Wonderful. The best, the best butt in the match was certainly not the Equalizer. No, <laughs> Mr. Wonderful's though was all right. Considered, <laughs> I love Mr. Wonderful to death. Yeah, uh, I remember the, when he was the shit. The the Equalizer was a big, burly, blonde-haired guy who, in order to convey that he was evil, pointed a lot. He did a lot of pointing. <laughs> And uh, you know he, looked he looked like, like he looked like an assistant coach at a high school football team. Yeah, oh, and he, uh, he reminded me of you. Remember when the WWF would make fun of Hulk Hogan, so they would dress a fat guy up and call him the Huckster. <laughs> he looked like him. Uh, the, the Equalizer was uh, Evad Sullivan. Mm -hmm. Was he a better known as Evad Sullivan for the three people who Up remember goes that? Bagwell down goes Bagwell. Was he also Norman the Lunatic? In no, Global? that was Bastion Booger. Okay. 
Um, also, um, Buff Bagwell, uh, or Marcus Alexander Bagwell, who was billed as the WCW Rookie of the Year, which they announced him as. the WCW Magazine. Yeah, um, they announced him as that for like three years going because he had no personality whatsoever at the time. He had a hell of tight ass. And he would do like male stripper thrust moves, like something out of Magic Mike, because (laughs) Too Cold Scorpio could dance really well. Like his whole thing was that he could dance really well. Uh, Bagwell couldn't keep up with uh, with Too Cold with Too Cold's moves, so he just goes back to his uh, his his roots and does kind of a weird pelvic thrust move, which really uh, discombobulated the equalizer. Um, Too Cold Scorpio and Bagwell won because uh, Too Cold Scorpio did his sweet 450 splash and uh, got sweet. the win. Yeah, it was very nice. Too Cold reminded me of a of a Coco with a little more size and power. Yeah, he was good. I loved him when I was a kid. Yeah! Next match was the match that Goodnight was looking forward to pretty heavily. Uh, it was the Nasty Boys versus Paul Roma and Arn Anderson. That's the one that would and uh, and the Nasty Boys' big s- surprise was that they were led to the ring by Missy Hyatt. Missy Hyatt was unfucking believable. <laughs> the crowd hated her ass, <laughs> chanting at one point, crack whore. They were throwing dollar bills at her. She came out resplendent in some leather jacket that had been spray painted with all Nasty Boys logos yeah. and a, a leopard print bodysuit Dude, she showing off an aging ass, though. She looked great. I, she looked like somebody's aunt at Thanksgiving nah, or something. No, nah, I thought she looked amazing. She, I, I didn't care much about I'll say this for Missy, the best, though. The best thing about, uh, not, to, not to interrupt, the best thing was... Uh, um, before they acknowledged it was Missy Hyatt, uh, Jesse the Body Ventura just goes, I recognize that chest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she probably should have saved all that money people were throwing at her. <laughs> she probably, yeah, she probably made more. They, they, she she hasn't she, made that much money in 20 years. She could have used that five bucks. <laughs> yeah, she hasn't because made that much money in 20 throughout years. throughout the entire right? match, uh... Two guys were throwing money at her. One was a dork guy in a uh, in a. I wrote down dork guy in bugle boy shirt <laughs> <laughs> and glasses, and a guy that looked like Bud Bundy were throwing money at her. Uh, they chanted uh, they chanted Porky Pig during the match. Uh, I don't know why. Michael Buffer announced I would have chanted Foghorn Leghorn. Uh, Michael Buffer announced her as the nastiest first lady of wrestling. <laughs> Arn Anderson, by the way, got my vote for best butt in this match. <laughs> um, yeah, so Arn Anderson looked like he was wrestling in his uh, tidy whiteies. Uh, it's also... Almost like Mr. Wrestling, too. You also have to point out the fact that Arn Anderson looks like a dad. Like, he looks like everyone's dad. He looks like the every dad. Like, if there was a platonic form of dadness, it would definitely be Arn Anderson because... I'm surprised he didn't ride a mower down to the ring. <laughs> <laughs> he looked like remember like the pitches you used to do in a ball game. Don't make me take off these flip flops and Bermuda shorts. Go <laughs> get in and whip your ass. <laughs> he should have he should have wrestled in slippers, honestly, <laughs> just in his house shoes. Um, Let's not forget Paul Roma. Paul, Paul Roma, Roma, fantastic mullet. Too. He had a very good mullet. There were there were four ass, too. there were four great Paul mullets in that ass. in that ring. There were four amazing mullets. There were the Nasty Boys, the uh, referee who uh, looked like a guy that hangs out in front of Craig and Auto Parts, and, uh, and Paul Roma. And Paul Roma, underrated dude. I agree. I always thought his career got tanked from the beginning when they used him as a high-profile jobber in the WWF. So by the time they put the Young Stallions together and tried to give him and uh, uh, Jim Powers a push, the guy's reps were already destroyed from all their high-profile jobs. Uh, the uh, Nasty Boys win. Through some tomfoolery and shenanigans. Yeah, what was the tomfoolery? I don't even know. I fell asleep in that match. It, it was lasted really, really. It lasted long. for twenty minutes. I, I don't. I don't remember. I kind of dozed off too, but I just remember there was like one person in the uh, crowd that was actually a fan of them. Yeah, yeah. Like their only fan. Of yeah, them. he had a sign that said "Welcome to Nastyville, Nasty Texas," Texas which is every city in Texas. <laughs> Should be called Nastyville. I have to say this, though. I thought the Nasty Boys' work wasn't as bad as I expected it would be. I, I, I'll say this. The work rate, to use a smart term like that, in WCW was always much uh, very underrated and a lot better than the WWF a lot of the time. Well, in 1993, they were less fat. 
I mean, they were still fat, yeah. but they were less yeah, but fat. They were, no, but, but their WWF wrestling was terrible. But the, here they didn't do that pit stop gimmick or any of that stupid shit. Uh, the, the Nasty Boys win, which leads to an interview with the motliest looking crew ever. Uh, Jesse the Body Ventura interviews the Nasty Boys and Missy Hyatt. <laughs> yeah, and they, they look were... like a post-apocalyptic gay club or something. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse's jacket, I mean, we're calling it a studded jacket. This jacket was practically silver. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It had like weird affliction logos yeah, on it, it like before Fred, affliction we existed. It was like Fred and Mercury kind of shit. But but it had like a lapel too. That was why it was so bizarre. Well, it was it a was motorcycle a... jacket deep down underneath all that like studs and everything. But it had like a lapel like a like a suit jacket, but then it was also covered in studs. <laughs> also leather pants too. Also leather pants, yeah. It's decked oh, out. <laughs> and a, and a, a blue tie-dyed uh, Led Zeppelin t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, which... Can't that. that was just peeking in there. You had to look close. At that yeah. The next match was, well, the next thing was a vignette, which was amazing, about the war between Cactus Jack and Big Van Vader. Uh, Cactus Jack wrestled Big Van Vader, won, which was a big deal. Yeah. And then Vader... Uh, demolished him like he 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 power bombed him on the concrete. He had to be taken away in a ambulance. Uh, his mysterious bag. Yeah, Vader apparently grabbed uh, Foley's bag, and Foley was just trying to get his bag back. It was like a little leather satchel about the size. It looks like a change purse. It that was you a little buy. mojo. It was some kind of talisman that I guess it, Foley was using. It, at it the looks time. like uh, it looks like uh, Jerry Garcia in a bag from Half Baked. It looked like he got it. <laughs> <laughs> it looked like he got it as a head shop or something. Yeah. And he kept like his Dungeons and Dragons dice in it. Um, they they go to a whole series of uh, finding Cactus Jack because he escaped from the ho- hospital. Uh, this Cactus shit Jack was unbelievable. Uh, Cactus Jack was apparently homeless With in no Cleveland beard and almost unrecognizable. And he uh, and he thought he was a sailor. He thought he was a sailor. A sailor in Cleveland. A cl- you know, those. You know how there's sailors in Cleveland? A fucking sailor. Just, just, uh, just, you know, trailing through the seas of late Cuyahoga River. Just yeah, like, you yeah, know. See, they got a river there, so maybe he's a riverboat captain. Or I know. <laughs> just pirating tide detergent. I don't know what. Uh, he's homeless. Uh, race. It looked like heart- he'd smeared stuff on his face. I don't too. know what it was. Um,. Harley Race had the bag, though. There was uh, He wanted that bag. He was like, you got my bag, and I want my bag back from you, Harley Race. Yeah, and so he Stop started sending bag. He started sending uh, mysterious packages to Harley Race, including a small packages box. Packages saying, I want my bag. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a, um, <laughs> a, a, one of the boxes had a small cactus in it, which made... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> which almost fell apart when he opened the box. <laughs> It pulled. It was like a, like a little tiny. I hope he sent it by the speedy delivery guy from Mr. Rogers. Yeah, it was a cactus like the size of my pointer finger. It was the tiny. It was the tiniest little cactus. It looks like my friend JB had a cactus that size that is named Don Prickles. Uh, that's what that's what it reminded me of. Little thing, Don Prickles. Which was. And then uh, and then cactus. Dig under it and get a drink of water. Cactus Jack proceeded to uh, to talk talk some crap and talk about how he was going to get his uh, his oh, possessions back. That pissed me off. He well, gave the most long winded promo, and he's done some long winded promo. But uh, he was doing it in front of uh, just a bunch of uh, posters for the Smashing Pumpkins album Siamese Dreams. <laughs> yes, <laughs> if, like let's just instantly date this <laughs> as much as we can. Building I'm gonna stand in front that. of an abandoned train station with a bunch of fucking Smashing Pumpkins Which, posters on the side. I didn't know this, but apparently Billy Corgan's a huge wrestling fan. <laughs> yeah, so Billy Corgan has in development right now a show on AMC, and it's currently just titled the Untitled Billy Corgan Wrestling Project. <laughs> Maybe Mick Foley will be on it. I just wanted to say <laughs> that I really loved <laughs> Gish more than the current album. <laughs> bang, bang. But not to mention the fact that he wasn't like standing in front of a boarded up window with Siamese Dream posters on it. He was walking and all the boarded up windows. The whole block had was covered with this Siamese shit. Dream. Yeah, uh, they were really plugging Siamese Dream. 
I thought um, I was watching MTV. From I don't know day. if they were on Warner Brothers at the time, so it could have been a sweet plug. It but man, there's a lot of subtle shit like that. Oh, uh, we didn't pay WCW. attention to anything that Cactus Jack said because we were getting pumpkin bread. <laughs> <laughs> and that was better. Smashing pumpkin bread, if you Sma- will. <laughs> and it cut to the next match, which was between uh, which was between Cactus Jack and um, Harley Race's number one mercenary, Yoshi Kwan. <laughs> and uh, of course, Cactus Jack had his attire from Ann Taylor clothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I said. I think I just took a look because he got the he got the uh, the cheetah print collar, and I, I looked at. it I was like, I think my mom had that blouse <laughs> at one point. <laughs> He bought his wrestling gear at Chico's. <laughs> he bought it he at Chico's. He had Chico. hair like most of the girls in my high school did. <laughs> Yoshi Kwan, by the way, is... Um, we got to talk a little bit about Yoshi it's Kwan. Chris Champion. Who wrestled, who wrestled previously... That's Kawabunga, uh, the wrestling ninja turtle yes. in Memphis. Uh, or Kayabunga, as Bill Dundee once called him. Now Yoshi Kwan, who... Uh, <laughs> Was definitely the most culturally insensitive character on this entire since, show. Since another Memphis favorite, P.Y. Chung High, which was Phil Hickerson dressed up as a Mongolian. It was bad. It was, uh, he, he had eyebrows that they would use in the Charlie Chan movies. Yeah. And he came out wearing kind of a kung fu outfit. Yeah, with I thought Manchurian number one slippers. son was going to come out with them. Yeah, it was like... <laughs> Uh, the music that was the playing. The music should have been. Uh, it was. It was. It was. Got, it, it, you guys laugh, but it was that culturally insensitive. Like that was just like. I thought I was watching a Mr. Moto movie. Yeah, it was bad, and uh, uh, there was a sign that um, that says uh, Cactus Jack will crumble Yoshi's cookie. <laughs> Which is a very contemporary Nintendo reference. Yeah. Cactus Jack had a lot of good, inspired a lot of good WCW signs. I remember there was another one, the Nasty Boys Will Be Cactus's Toys. So maybe it was the same person. <laughs> the uh, uh, Yoshi Kwan did a lot of, um, the, the best Yoshi Kwan move was he did a Bruce Lee flying sidekick into Cactus Jack's butt. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to bring up the butts in, in Smash and the issue of Cactus Jack's butt. <laughs> Cactus Jack developed what I call a Dan Aykroyd butt. He, Mick Foley has the most confounding butt in show business. It's, like, it's a lot like Dan Aykroyd's. Where Dan, does there's it a start? Gauge. Where does it end? Yeah, what is it? Well, again, what's it look like? Very similar to Dan Aykroyd. And you can actually tell how funny a Dan Aykroyd movie is going to be by the girth of his butt. So, Driving Miss Daisy, not funny at all. No. Well, well he was a bit part in that one. Yeah, and he's sitting. He's ass. sitting down because it's a lot of driving. His so fucking, you don't really see it then. His ass in that movie, when they, when you do see it, when he turns around to hug her, yeah. oh, my God. It takes up the whole goddamn screen. I didn't see that scene. I had to make water his, in the theater before, his, I, before that part. He could. His thighs are lethal weapons. He could smash a man to death. <laughs> wow. All you would need to do is just one clamp, and you would suffoc- You would disappear into Dan Aykroyd's thighs <laughs> and driving Miss Fucking Daisy. <laughs> the, uh, the match thankfully lasted for about two and a half minutes. Uh, Yoshi Kwan was uh, not good. He was not a good wrestler. No, nor did he have a good butt. Best, uh, <laughs> my pick, best butt in this match, Harley Race. <laughs> uh, Cactus Jack won very quickly, and then he uh, punched Harley Race in the face and took his bag back. So, so he has he all of his, his he got all of his material possessions back and he is going to take it out on Vader. The end. Uh, <laughs> mercifully short. If mercifully short. The vignette with all that crazy stuff with him becoming homeless is probably longer than the match. Uh, yeah, it was bad. Uh, then we get to the most awesome part of the show, which was a recap of uh, Rick Rude and Rick Flair's feud because that was the next match. Rick Rude. Uh, the best butt in that match. Uh, well, Rick Rude, they show what Rick Rude did to uh, anger Ric Flair. And in Ric Flair's quote-unquote penthouse, uh, that was a set-up stage at a... Uh, oh, was it not actually a flair for the gold? Yes, Which was yeah. his Piper's Pit-like interview show? Rick Rude uh, was wearing the most amazing outfit ever. Rick Rude was definitely in full Tom Selleck mode. Like, he looked short hair, mustache, very Tom Selleck-y, wearing a leopard print sweatsuit velour uh no shirt full chest hair uh gold like chain just got out of bed yeah gold chain uh a fanny pack of course and a sweet pair of la gear <laughs> he just he just lifted the outfit from missy hot like yeah. she was the one it was very leopard print heavy cactus jack leopard print missy hyatt leopard print rick rude 
Leopard print. <laughs> Jesse Ventura. Jesse Ventura. Leopard print. Yeah. Rick Rude, really into um, Rick Flair's personal made Fifi. Rick Rude uh, beats the tar out of uh, Rick Flair and gives him the Rude Awakening neckbreaker on the sweet uh, checker chessboard uh, tile of the quote unquote penthouse. <laughs> and the noise that Rick Flair makes is just, uh. <laughs> like a like an eight bit Nintendo getting hit sound. Ugh. Not even that enthusiastic. Just like uh. like in Gauntlet. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wizard shot the food. <laughs> just, Warrior is about to die. Uh, he get, mm. he just get uh, snake farm. Uh, uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> 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 so they have the times. they have the they have the match Ric Flair and Rick Rude. This match lasted forever and a day. Uh, they moved. They were moving through molasses oh the entire time. God, this match was so bad because we thought, or at least I thought, Rick Rude versus Ric Flair. These guys can work. Let's see how it's going to be. This thing crawled at a snail's pace, like they was wrestling, like it was a molasses mud wrestling. The uh, to show you how little Michael Buffer cared about professional wrestling, he introduced <laughs> them and said Ric Flair would like to say a few words, and then handed the microphone to Rick Rude. <laughs> Well, there's two Ricks. That's really confusing. Well, you can't confuse the two. They are like two. They, their names might be Rick, but it's like you couldn't confuse the two of them. Well, put yourself in Michael Buffer's position at this point. He's probably just super fun. Rick Rude has the word ravishing on the back of his bathrobe. <laughs> <laughs> he was probably about to pass out from fucking boredom, though. You could see people leaving like during the show. Yeah, that was what I, I, I was going to say the about the title match. I was going to say about the crowd. Like, the first, like, everybody sitting around the ring seemed to be there for the WCW pay-per-view. The people in the stands seemed to be waiting around for the AAA fucking basketball game that was going to start right <laughs> afterwards. Like, they double-booked the venue, and the people that were sitting in the back, no signs. They weren't even moving. They were. It just no, seemed like they, they were waiting for a, a bus. There was a good amount of people there, at least at the beginning, but they weren't doing nothing. nothing. Unless that crowd footage they showed was from a basketball game or something. Yeah, they the just cropped. <laughs> that green screen, it, like, cropped. The uh, Rick uh, Rick. Rude uh, takes off his robe to show Ric Flair a his airbrush tights where uh, Fifi had, was airbrushed on Rick's crotch and Rick and Fifi in hearts is t is on the his butt, which was the best butt of the match, even better than Fifi's. Yeah, and he he made sure to no, he no made butt sure of the night is still coming up. Uh, he made sure to gyrate a whole lot. <laughs> uh, at one point, he uh, he gyrated at Fifi. Very slow uh, and very centrally, and then Ric Flair jumped off the rope and double axe handled him on top of the head. But he didn't really killed my. He just kind of he head. just kind of bonked him Three Stooges style. It wasn't really a hit. It was like a bonk. I think I heard the word numb skull or something like that. <laughs> Here's how you know a match is bad when the thought occurs to you, Jesus, I wish they would just fucking bring out the Shockmaster already. <laughs> I had that thought. Uh, Mr. Goodnight and I were trying to figure out who was going to show their butt first between Rick Rude and Ric Flair Which because they both... Surprisingly, no one did. They both loved to show off their butts during Way matches. Way too much. There was a guy in the crowd that had the greatest shirt ever. <laughs> it just said, y'all on it. <laughs> There was a lot of great crowd in there, and they actually went. There wasn't a lot of good match. Yeah, there were, the crowd, crowd was awesome. It was a great cross section of Texas circa 1993. Texicans, uh, uh, as Jesse Ventura calls them, and I don't know why. He uh, always has called them that. Texicans. He just always like, has called them that. I'm just waiting for him to run for president in 2016 and do a whistle stop tour I in want like you Austin. Want Texicans to vote for me? Yeah, no. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you secede from the union, you Texicans. <laughs> Again. Up goes the Zionists, down goes the towers, up goes Israel. No way, Jose. <laughs> Just, oh, Jesse, what happened to you? I wish Jesse Coulter was there. That would have been good. Uh, so there was a guy in the crowd with a fiery, what could be described as a fiery blonde mullet and was wearing a uh, shirt that we weren't sure if it was made by Cross Colors, the United Colors of Bentaton, or Bugle Boy. <laughs> It looked like somebody wandered off the set of I Left My Wallet in El Segundo video. <laughs> yeah, I was going, my vote went to Bugle Boy. It looks just like a shirt I had when I was in first grade. I yeah. imagine he had Ace Ventura's pants. And he had, <laughs> <laughs> and he, he was taking a lot of photos with his Minolta camera. I saw uh, that. A 110, 110 I never, camera. Uh, I never heard anybody bring that up, but I noticed that he was like just taking pictures right there. Though. Now, he, he, uh, he, uh, the ending of this match was absolutely horrible. 
uh, Ric Flair sandbagged. Oh, the rest of it. Well, Rick ba- Rick Flair sandbagged the entire match because he didn't like Rick Rude probably. Yeah, that, um, because this thing so, just slow as shit. So um, Rick Rude confronts Fifi. Uh, she slaps him. He kisses her violently, carries her into the ring. Uh, Ric Flair bonks uh, Rude over the head again. And Fifi will not leave the ring. She just stands there like a statue. Uh, Ric Flair puts Rude in the figure four, and Rick Rude digs into his tights for an, an uncomfortably long time, pulls out brass knuckles, hits Rick in Which the I head. I think was a wristwatch masquerading as brass knuckles. And Ric Flair and wins. It was rattling around in there with his junk. Yeah, and Rick, Rick Rude wins, and he uh, gets the belt. He does not make any overtures at Fifi, even though he kept saying that he was going to get the belt and the girl. Uh, I but think he was just with happy that? with the belt. They cut back to uh, Jesse Ventura, who's getting sweatier. Uh, he still looks like Rob Halford. Uh, well, when you got no hair like that, the sweat just beats. A lot down of your head. a lot of shots of his sweet rat tail, and uh, Cash and uh, Shivani shows off his awesome Casio wristwatch. <laughs> I can't remember if it was at this point uh, of the pay-per-view or when uh, Missy Hyatt was still out there, but there's a point where Jesse Ventura's just in the chair rocking and staring at him like a creep. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it was, really bad. It's really fucking awful. Okay, so we have War Games the Match Beyond. Um, <laughs> at this point, we're dead tired. I want to say this. The <laughs> War Games match was not that bad. We were just so worn out yeah. after the last couple of matches. I didn't well, think it was that bad. They, the one... Spot? Are we starting from the beginning, or can we just jump to the middle? Because the one spot you didn't like the Dustin Rhodes uh, uh, pulling, doing the Ricky Morton in there and well, taking his du- boot off, du- wrestling du- in his sock. Dustin Rhodes, aka Gold Dust. Uh, uh, Dustin Rhodes was bleeding like somebody shot him in the face with a shotgun or something. <laughs> he was just like Daddy in that respect. Yeah, but he, all, like Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, also had a a little patch of his body in this case his kidneys were just taped it looked like the whore drugged him and he woke up in a bathtub of ice with a letter to call 911 <laughs> and then he just had to show up to wrestle it looks like someone stole his kidneys and then maybe marlena stole his kidney they uh they had a uh, the rules which lasted forever <laughs> <laughs> the most insane byzantine fucking rules like by the time the match started like if you just watched it for a minute you would get it but like the way they were explaining it it was like they were explaining you know like like the geneva convention at and the shit. same time though it was also rushed yeah they, it, it was, was explaining complicated it re- but rushed well it's because he was explaining it really fast not to the television audience but to the live audience you could hear it coming over the pa system so he was trying to explain it to a, a room full of people who were just waiting to see an amateur basketball game uh the best part was was they had a graphic showing the rules and one of the best rules on there was winner of the referee toss sends in a second man <laughs> Which got our hopes up really high, and they were certainly dashed when they didn't throw Nick Patrick into the crowd. I thought referee toss was something else altogether. Yeah, I was hoping it would be like the first scene of Wolf of Wall Street where they're just throwing the ref around. <laughs> yeah. Better um, Nick Patrick. They, uh, they drop the cage really slow, and the, uh, the cage is shooting pyro indiscriminately. While a re- <laughs> while, while, I kind of like that. While there's a rights free <laughs> theme song. It was misleading. Sh- shooting pyro indiscriminately and in the process, I believe, breaking the top of one of the cages. Because <laughs> then they proceeded to do the stupidest spot over and over. They would just lift Sting and just put him against the cage above him. Yeah, I don't even see how that hurts. Yeah, it doesn't. The cage while they didn't even like up, grind him on there like it was like. They were trying to like rip his skin with the cage. They were just like yeah. placing him up there. Uh, there was a rights-free theme that was very sweet. Um, uh, <laughs> if if you want to know what theme it is, it's the theme that they use in every um, uh, Hi- History Channel show about yeah. the Roman Empire. <laughs> I, I, much, I think the Battlestar Galactica theme showed up at the beginning. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> I, I think I mentioned this before, but yeah, every once in a while you'll watch some show about Rome and they'll just be playing Goldberg's theme, <laughs> talking about the fucking, you know, the conquest of Gaul. Who's next? Germania, that, they're next. <laughs> I was watching I was, uh, I was watching the Guy Fieri wa- show one time and they were playing the Hardy Boys theme song as they were showing a <laughs> montage of kitchen shots of a... Uh, <laughs> I love were, that song. Were they making the Hardy Boys uh, fried chicken? <laughs> <laughs> they were making swanton soup. Uh, <laughs> um, Hello, Joe. Uh, I like you, Joe Bolin. There you was, got balls. Uh, the, the bad guy team was Harlem Heat. 
uh, at the time they were not called Booker T and Stevie Ray. They were called Kane and Cole, which was very disorienting because even the announcers didn't know who was Kane and who was Cole. But they were wearing awesome halter tops that they got at Contempo Casuals. <laughs> <laughs> they were very large, very jacked men wearing women's halter tops with flames on them. Because they are the Harlem Heat. Psycho Sid Vicious was there. Uh, Just you know. wandering around the ring and not doing anything. Sid Justice. Oh, Sid Justice was uh, very angry, very Southern, and was still rocking his body glove. Uh, he rocked the body glove almost as good as the lead singer of Living Color. He was pissed <laughs> off. He was pissed off and he was very because it wasn't softball season. So yeah, and got nothing to do. He's angry. And Vader, for some reason, the side of his trunks did not say Vader. They said Ader. <laughs> A-D-E-R And then the good guy team was Dustin Rhodes uh, The British Imagine. Bulldog uh, Sting uh, Animal from the Legion of Doom was not wrestling He was just hanging out in his spiked shoulder pads Just kind of there Just kind of there He was at craft services and they were like Hey Animal, do you want to go out? And he's like, sure dude um, Cash that paycheck, why the hell not? And the, the, he the more best more enthused about his paycheck for nothing Than the, the Michael and the Buffer best, did And the best part of the match The Shockmaster Uncle Fred. Who we've covered before had the most awesome debut in the history of wrestling where he fell through the wall and fell on his face and his stormtrooper uh, helmet fell off. Uh, magically, he has turned into a construction worker. <laughs> went from Which he actually did at night. <laughs> yeah, he went straight from the arena. Probably made better money. <laughs> he was fixing. Like, yeah, Michael Buffer's getting all the gate for this damn thing. He walked in the parking lot and then hopped on the little pulley thing and went up and was helping tar the roof. Well, well, well. <laughs> Surprised I didn't have him fix the roof of the cage. And if you want to know what Sh if you want to know what Shockmaster looks like, Shockmaster looks like a very large George Went with a mustache. <laughs> uh, Norm. So the first people into the ring was were Vader and Dustin Rhodes against everybody's. Um, Advice, Dustin Rhodes was very angry, and he might have been missing a kidney, or he might have. It looked like he either he was as, missing a shoe. That's the damn oh show. Oh, yeah, because he took off his shoe to, to hit Vader with, his cowboy boot, and uh, he wrestled the whole match with one yellow cowboy boot on and one Hanes gray toad sock. <laughs> <laughs> he did his daddy proud, though, because he bled like a stuck pig. Yeah, and he hit people with his shoe. I liked it. <laughs> Uh, Stevie Ray and uh, Dust and Vader proceeded to beat the tar out of Dustin Rhodes, and then Sting came in. And Let, Sting, let's talk about a man called Sting. Best butt in <laughs> match, best butt in the pay per view, <laughs> best butt in wrestling. <laughs> One of the best butts in the world. There is mine to consider, but this uh, Sting got a kind of butt like they once said in PWI. You can balance a glass of ice water on. Um. That thing is just tight, you know, rock uh, hard ass. Sting, Sting, and and um, and Dustin Rhodes did an okay job of fighting off the bad guys, and then Sid came in, and Sid just stood around and just walked. He didn't really do anything. He Typical just looked Sid really match, confused. Really. Except he didn't injure anybody. <laughs> It would have been a lot better if they just gave Sid a microphone and let him talk for an hour. That would have been way better than this pay-per-view. They could have had him do running commentary of what was going on. Yeah, just put Animal in there and fucking let Sid be on commentary. <laughs> the uh, camera, There were cameramen in the cage, which gave zero vantage points, so there was a lot of close-ups of uh, Vader's very ruddy, very sweaty, very uh, strained face, which was not a good I know, visual. I was hoping for Sting's ass, but all we got was <laughs> Vader looking like a... Uh, apple is that an apple? Oh, it's made his head. Davy, Davy, oh yeah. I was just gonna say the cameramen were horrible in this. Yeah, they were not good. This there was the worst part. Yeah, they were. They. It's hard to film a match like that. To be but there was a but lot they were of like bad in the ring and like getting hit and shit. Someone like. justified putting a cameraman inside the cage. Yeah, I he was so, inside. You wouldn't the be fucking... able to see it good if they didn't. That was the thing. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I don't. Do they? They don't have a camera guy inside the cage for WWE, do no. they? Uh, yeah, I yeah they. I don't know if they ever had, but this was like. Th don't forget, this was also a double ring thing. They were alternating the rings, which was very, very awkward when somebody had to walk around one wrestling ring to get into another wrestling ring. Well, so the Shockmaster finally got in the ring. It took him about an hour and a half to get through the ropes of one and yeah. then through the other. Uh, after Sid was trip. after Sid was Davy Boy, who was the most fringed person in the history of mankind. He had fringed boots. He had fringed. Um, he, he had fringed. He looked like jazzer size every time he moved. <laughs> he, uh, he he there were. He, at one point, he had an interview, and jokingly, I said, his interview, he should have just said, you may have seen me in such things as Jumpin' Jack Flash, 
Theodore Rex <laughs> and the movie Ghost. <laughs> he looked like Brandy in the Girl Is Mine video. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they were doing a lot of the lifting the guy into the cage move, which made no sense. It was not, not good. It was um, kind of claustrophobic. And then the shock master came in. He didn't trip, but he had to walk through four sets of ropes. Which took a long time. <laughs> and to his credit, Jesse Ventura made fun of him the whole time. <laughs> but this oh, damnedest thing was. <laughs> the damnedest thing was the whole match seems like it was just there to push the shock master because yeah. he gets in the ring and he ends up bear hugging. Who the yeah, hell was he it? wins the thing. Booker T. And the, that's it. It's yeah, over. that's it. He, he dominates. The thing is, is that he oh, here bear hugs Booker T for a good 30 seconds, 45 seconds. And the all the guys were fighting each other except for Sid, who was just looking at it, just marveling at this bear hug like he was entranced by the fact <laughs> That he was just like, oh boy, is that George Went? I don't know what it was. Like he was like he just was trying to work out a softball schedule. I know he was just like staring, and the whole thing was was that the match had to end in in their terms, submit or surrender. So he had to like save Booker T from the bear hug of doom in order to prevent Booker T from submitting or surrendering. Which I don't know what the difference between the two is. He just it's stood terms there. with a surrender. Yeah, like the team just like draws up formal papers and they yeah. fucking wheel out a Maybe desk. they get to keep some territory or something. Or <laughs> they, officers get to keep their swords or some get, shit. They get on a plane and go to Versailles. Yeah. <laughs> Teddy they pull, Roosevelt they pull in a They it. pull in a battleship or something like that, you know. <laughs> it's intrepid. Like, I know. <laughs> She's just like, era. now that you've won war games, now you can annex the Amarillo territory and <laughs> and the Mid South territory. <laughs> Cleveland sailors escort this, these people to the boat. <laughs> um, and the Shockmaster won. So Sid just yelled into the, the the into the camera, all angry afterwards. He could have stopped it. And he was just Booker was intimidating. Sid was just like, "You daggone stinky shock master! This is stupid. <laughs> it's just stupid. You got half. I got half brain. You do. I <laughs> fucking idiot, man. It's a bumbling it moron. Like his meds were starting to kick. <laughs> no, that's just how he yells. He just he cannot enunciate words. Shock master! <laughs> you get me a job putting tar on the roof. Because <laughs> WCW is just stupid. Uh, essentially, Rick, uh, Sid is Sid was the Gary Busey of '90s wrestling. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was the Gary Busey of '90s wrestling. I think that says it all. It all stops tonight. But you know and I know that you are only half the man that I am. And I have half the brain that you do. Week. <laughs> tried to make me look like a jackass. This pay per view was god awful. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was not the, the the fortune did not smile on us. It was dull. You understand? The most disappointing part for me is like I'm a huge Mick Foley fan, and like just watching him get upstaged by a Siamese Dream poster kind of <laughs> kind of bothered me. I love that album, but Jesus Christ, like <laughs> today is the greatest <laughs> day. <laughs> Bang bang. Um, uh, so final well, words. Actually, let me let me let me do a round table for a moment. We all know Sting was the best butt. <laughs> best butt besides Sting. <laughs> Pat. No Vader. <laughs> okay. Rivers. It's got to be Mick Foley. Mick Foley's butt is the question. Could God make a rock so heavy that he himself could not lift it? It's that mysterious. <laughs> It's a snake eating its own tail. It is I don't, I It see, is the alpha and the omega of butt. I seem to recall that God made a rock so heavy that he moved away from the tomb. The only thing God made he could not carry by himself was a cross, but he carried it for you. Nick, what do you think of the best butt? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Sting, I didn't think, had the best butt. I think Arn Anderson did, like, <laughs> hands down. <laughs> um, Without question, best butt in the universe. My own choice besides Sting, Rick is steam butt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, final words, guys. What's the final words that you have on this pay per view, Mister Goodnight? I'd seen worse. I mean, I've had dental operations and shit, and that was worse. <laughs> uh, biggest problem I think with this one: some pay per views are lousy because they're stupid. 
This one was just lousy because all the matches just weren't that great. It was very slow paced and shit went on too long and there was no heat in any match. Uh, Nick? Uh, I, for starters, I, I don't think I like wrestling anymore. <laughs> I'm canceling the WWE network when I get home. Back my 995. Yeah, yeah. give me it all back. Rivers. My wife. <laughs> I enjoyed the uh, the the post game discussion. I think next time, because I just realized we could do this, uh, I want to see NWO sold out. Uh, that's, I saw that one back in the day. That was in the bag. That I know. I I know it was in the bag. I, that that's what I. Hope I liked we'll, it back in the day. We'll we'll do this again at some point because this was great. I want to. Uh, yeah, NWO sold out is uh, is the next one. But as for this one, it was it was so goddamn boring. Uh, <laughs> there was. The, the Rick Flair Rick Rude thing is what really disappointed me. Cause yeah, because Rick Flair is one of my all-time favorites. I thought at least favorites. the Steamboat match and the Flair match were going to be good. Actually, yeah, Steamboat Flair match was decent. Flair match was garbage. I would I would say that this uh, was probably one of the least interesting three hours I've ever spent watching television. I've watched bad football games and watched them from beginning to end. I've watched bad baseball games from beginning to end. I've watched just. Horrible stuff from beginning to end. I've watched, you know, bad movies with commercial breaks from beginning to end. And this was one of the most slow plotting things I've ever watched in my entire life. Um, I I did. There were some good parts. There was uh, Too Cold Scorpio, always awesome. Good Night and his uh, r random interest in the wrestler's butts was awesome. That was the best part. Was, this was a great parade uh, of butts. Um, the crowd made the show. They were ridiculous. They chanted some of the most inane stuff ever. They had some super mullets. There were some super mullets. So if you really enjoy hilarious hair, I would give this five stars, uh, two hilarious. thumbs up. Uh, if you wanted to enjoy this for professional wrestling action, I would give it uh, one star. I'd give it four for the butts if, <laughs> if we're watching for butts. I give uh, one star to the pay-per-view, five stars to uh, all of the things just hanging off of Davey Boy Smith. <laughs> uh, five stars to Arn Anderson's uh, underwear, <laughs> and no stars, and I don't recommend this to anybody that wants to continue watching wrestling. <laughs> Nick, where can people find you on the internet, sir? Uh, I'm on Twitter at uh, nthomasnotfunny, <laughs> working on changing. <laughs> So I get a lot of shit for it. Branding, my friend, across the board. You have a different Instagram uh, title, right? Yeah, Pastor Nick Thomas. Nice, nice, perfect. And uh, you can find us, uh, well, you can find this match on the WWE Network uh, and it's possibly, YouTube somewhere still. possibly, it's, it's probably on YouTube or Daily Motion too. Uh, it is garbage. Don't watch it. <laughs> Follow us on Twitter at The Goods Pod. I want to watch it for the bets. <laughs> Uh, find us on facebook.com slash the goods pod. Uh, give us a rating if you haven't already on iTunes. If you enjoy the show, if you listen every week, uh, go to iTunes, give us five stars. That helps us out. And uh, tell your friends about the show. And uh, we'll see you next time. We'll close out the show with a song from Glossary. This song is off of their album Feral Fire, and it's called Lonely as a Town. <laughs>
The Goose from the Woods is mixed and edited by me, Rivers Langley, and distributed by Westcast Network. Our theme song is composed by DJ Smiles. You can find him online at djsmiles.net. 